Well, good evening, Ian. Um, good, for everybody good who's listening to this, um, this is, of course, Professor Ian Stewart, um, one of the joint authors of the Science of Discworld series. Um, so a question I'm sure you've been asked before, Ian, but people keep asking, is tell us, how did this all come about? Well, it started in 1990 when I got a strange phone call from somebody called Jack Cohen, who said he'd been reading one of my books and wanted to have a chat. And we went to the pub and we were still in the pub four hours later chatting. Now, Jack was a biologist. I was a mathematician, but we um, found more common ground than we expected. And in particular, science fiction was a passion for both of us. And Jack was a convention animal. I collected the books more. So Jack dragged me off to the local science fiction group's convention where he was guest of honour that year. And we were sitting there and suddenly Jack says, oh, there's Terry. I thought, Terry? Terry who? Oh, Terry Pratchett, he said. He does these Discworld books. I thought, oh, yeah, that's... Yes, I've heard of those, That's but that's fantasy, isn't it? And he said, well, <laughs> maybe not. So anyway, we had lunch together. And after that, for years, Jack and I would drop by Terry if we were passing. And we were doing various books together. And eventually, on one occasion, I think it was a Discworld convention um, or a science fiction convention. No, it's a science fiction convention. Um, we were over in Dudley, which is near Birmingham and is uh, not the most uh, attractive of towns. And we decided the hotel food was um, getting a bit boring. So we all went out to a Mongolian restaurant, which Jack knew of. And while there, probably on the influence of lots of beer, we um, decided that it would be a good idea to, to write a science book based on the Discworld series. Um, it was the time when a book called uh, The Physics of Star Trek had got going. But the first thing that Terry said was, we can't do it that way. You can't explain scientifically what's going on in Discworld because it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and the whole project nearly died at that point. <laughs> Until about six months later, Jack and I were in the common room at the math department at Warwick University. and the idea emerged that if there was no science in Discworld, we could get Terry to put some there. But it couldn't be in Discworld because Discworld runs on magic. But the wizards could invent or stumble across or accidentally bring into being the Round World project, which was our entire universe inside a football sized magical containment field that keeps the magic out. And the science therefore takes over on the inside. And then the wizards can have great deal of fun failing completely to understand how that sort of thing works because it doesn't work the way magic does and uh, we we knew we were onto something when jack and i decided the best way to get terry to agree to this was we would try to write a little bit of the discworld part <laughs> so we wrote a, a discworld scene and sent it to terry it's something like this no 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 it couldn't possibly work like that I'll tell you how it should go. <laughs> oh, got him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we did the first book. And it was, um, there, there were a few interesting obstacles along the way from publishers and things and agents, but we got over all those and it was a big success, I think, to Terry's surprise. And, um, and then he said, well, that was enormous fun, but we can't really do another one, can we? Because, you know, you can't match that. That would... Um, the sequel's never as good so yeah. we thought yeah, well I suppose he's probably right yeah uh, it was it was great fun and then he says if we did do another one what would it be about <laughs> and this was a sign that Jack and I had to go away and spend hours and hours and hours trying to come up with an idea that was good enough to satisfy Terry and we kind of repeated that and ended up doing four books in the series so who decided the themes of the next three books? Was that Terry or was it you and Jack? It was me and Jack. We, we, we had regular conversations with Terry, which were always fun, even if they went off in other directions. <laughs> um, and 
basically, Jack and I put together scenarios. The the Discworld books, which of course um, the science of Discworld books, the, the fans know this, but they're different from physics of Star Trek because basically it's a short story set in Discworld, chopped into pieces and interspersed with scientific commentary. And the commentary is about what's happening in round world. So from the science point of view, we can do anything. You now we could take this week's edition of, of Nature, the science journal and go through the papers in it. And say we'll talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> but there has to be a story they fit into. So Jack and I had to design a framework for the Discworld story. Terry would then tear it to pieces and redo it. But it was our job to come up with something that grabbed his attention. And this usually took between 15 and 20 different scenarios <laughs> before we hit on one that he liked. So from that point on, Terry started writing his story we'd already agreed with him at least some of the science topics so he knew where to put some pegs we could hang the science on and he would get out in front of us with the Discworld story we would follow along behind with the science chapters but from time to time we would get together and say okay here's where we are now where do we think this is going next and occasionally Jack and I would write a science chapter for Terry to look at before he did his Discworld bit. And it kind of co-evolved. But it, although it's a three author co collaboration, it was really Terry collaborating with a joint Jack and Ian. Right. And then we collaborated independently and we got used to that. We knew how to do that. So it's a sort of nested two author <laughs> <laughs> collaboration. Uh, as a result of which it worked brilliantly and then once we got a first draft everyone was free to try and edit everybody else's contributions jack and i didn't edit terry's bit much <laughs> <laughs> and when we when we finally agreed yeah okay it's almost ready to go to the publisher then terry took over and did a complete scattering of fairy dust he said for the whole thing this would be footnotes under the science bits as well as yeah the some footnotes and terry revived the the uh, the art of the footnote jack and i tend to think of our chapters as giant footnotes <laughs> <laughs> they're just too big to put in a footnote but uh, they 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 uh, play the same sort of role yeah and uh focusing, a lot of just, focusing just on the third book which is darwin's watch yeah. Um, I was always impressed by the fact that one of you had identified that the whole true story of Charles Darwin and the way he came to actually be on the Beagle. And I think most of what you put in there is true. Mm -hmm. um, but was it you or was it Jack who came? It was on me. Beagle? It was me. I'd been, we, we were scrabbling around trying to find a suitable theme for the, the third book. And Jack and I suggested uh, that, that the, the Martian equivalent of this world should invade and it would be a cross between War of the Worlds and, um, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. And Terry said, what do you think this world's about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that won't work. Um, so we were trying to find something. And I, I was reading a very nice biography of Darwin. And this revelation, I, I was reading it and thinking, that makes no sense. This could not possibly happen. You know, um, Darwin wants to go on this voyage on the Beagle, but his father says, no, you can't go. No, no you want to join the, I want you to join the family business or be a country vicar or whatever, but you're not going to go around the world for three years, as, as they thought it was at that time. And then for some reason, the father says, unless your uncle says otherwise. Now, his uncle was one of these sort of very worldly, let the lad do what he wants type of, and everybody knew this. So this must have been his father's way to get an excuse to allow him to go, probably one that will work with the mother. I don't know. And I, but I thought that, wait a minute, that's the wizards interfering. This is Darwin's life, but it's being interfered with by Discworld. And as I read more and more of, of the true biography, I spotted three or four other places where it was absolutely obvious. You know, the, the narrativium of Darwin's life does not work as a story, unless the wizards are interfering. 
<laughs> and so I phoned Jack up the next morning. He said, Jack, I know how to do it. I said, this is, you know, Darwin writes the wrong book. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he, he, the, the whole of Victorian England actually is very happy with intelligent design and God did everything. And uh, and then, then the wizard realised it's gone off the rails and have to put his... What are you on? He says, <laughs> <laughs> and it all went from there. It did take us six months to figure out the title for the wrong book that Darwin was writing, because I knew there was a joke there and I couldn't figure it out. So we had the origin of species, something of species, and then I suddenly realised. I mean, the 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 book that Victorian England actually was very happy with that all explained how God did everything was called um, natural theology. I thought, ah, theology of species, the origin, the ology. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, so it, it kind of assembled itself. And I'm assuming there's a reference there to Richard Dawkins, the blind watchmaker. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Well, the blind watchmaker was a riposte to natural theology. Uh, the, the, the whole argument in natural theology starts with if, if you're walking on the heath and you find a watch and you look at the intricate manner in which this behaves and does the task for which it is suited, somebody must have designed it. So if you find a frog, which is also very intricate and does the job that frogs ought to do, somebody must have designed it. And Dawkins took this to pieces in The Blind Watchmaker. Um, and we actually, uh, we got Richard's permission for this because we kind of know him. And um, the Reverend Richard Dawkins appears <laughs> <laughs> in the book with his permission. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it because Richard Dawkins has certain opinions about religion. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, yeah, um, no, he, I mean, he's... Um, He's quite relaxed and friendly when you get him off his hobby horse. Um, yeah, so he, he was quite happy to. I mean, he was a very good friend of Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide. Mm. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, so we had a lot of fun with that one. Yes, the, the fourth one was difficult because we were we, we'd figured out what the story was and agreed it with Terry and we were within a day of sending the proposal to the publisher. And then Terry phoned up and said, I've just been diagnosed with postcortical atrophy, mm -hmm. early onset Alzheimer's. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so we said, well, that book's not important, goes on the back burner. We may come back to it when you sort out you know, your problems. Um, and then Terry embarked on I think he decided that if he was going to go early, he would write as much as he possibly could before <laughs> he went. <laughs> and he was turning, he was, uh, you know, extraordinarily active. And one day, I think about three years after his diagnosis, it was still not too bad at that point. He phoned us up and said, Jack, Ian, we were together at the time. He said, um, the, uh, this fourth Discworld, Science of Discworld book, now, I'm up to my ears in writing. I've got all sorts of things I want to do. We thought, oh, okay, then it's going to be scrapped. He says, so I think this is a really good time to start another book. <laughs> and uh, so with that one, basically he sat down, wrote his story, and Jack and I were writing the science chapters in parallel. Um, and then we all got together for one day down um, near where Terry lived, um, with his uh, personal assistant, Rob, and sat around the computer, well, three big computer screens, because by then he had to have the letters one inch high on the screen to read them. And he dictated to Rob, who typed it in. And the three of us sat around the computer screen and line by line wrote two pages extra for the, site, for the Discworld story to make the whole book come together. Um, so Terry was that I was prepared to make a huge effort under very difficult circumstances. I mean, writing was no longer came naturally in the sense that it was in his head, but you've got to get it into the computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's hard work. Um, but it worked so well that by lunchtime, Terry says, OK, we're done. Let's go to the pub. 
so we went to the pub. Uh, yeah, so I, that was, I was always impressed by the, the, the extent to which he would go for other people. And on that occasion, we benefited from it. He was a remarkable man. Yeah, yeah. And you and Jack have obviously been a partnership for quite a long time. And I believe you've got a small story to share with us. I have. Well, uh, Jack, Jack died a few years ago. Um, he was 84, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, he was 84 at the time. Um, so, you know, I, he had a good innings. But um, he is remembered very fondly by about 90% of the people who knew him, and the other 10% have a very different opinion, <laughs> Jack being Jack. But there's, there is a lovely story which any... It's straight out of Discworld, really. You could put this into Discworld. So um, it goes right back to when Jack was a lecturer at Birmingham University doing research on feathers. He was doing developmental biology, how do feathers grow? He was actually interested in hair, which is very similar. And I think was looking for a cure for baldness, but he was actually working with chickens and feathers. And it was experimental science. So he had an animal room with cages with chickens. And uh, the government from time to time sent an inspector to check the animals were being held under reasonable conditions. And the inspector, who was a chap called Colonel Oddling Smee. You could make it. Yeah, no, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. Um, I think he was a colonel. He was certainly a military man, somewhere fairly high up. And Oddling Smee definitely is correct. You can't forget a name like that. <laughs> OK, he was due to visit. The day before he visited, Jack, for some reason, had visited some people who lived on a canal boat who were keeping a pet monkey. And Jack realized that the pet monkey was not being kept in very good conditions. And I think with a few threats of calling the authorities, persuaded them to hand the monkey over to him. So it became a rescue monkey. He then had the problem, what do you do with the monkey? So he stuck it in a cage and put it in the animal room. Right. So the day of the visit arrived and about a quarter of an hour before Oddling Smee was due to turn up, Jack arrives outside the animal room and his two young lady lab assistants are standing there saying, Jack, don't go in. We'll sort it. Delay the inspector by half an hour. Find some excuse. No, don't ask questions. Just get on with it. And they disappeared inside, which I thought, what the hell's going on? <laughs> so what do I do? Oh, I know. OK, well, uh, Odding Smee is going to visit the head of department first as a, as a courtesy call. So he rushed off to the head of department, who was a very straight laced sort of slightly Germanic person, um, and said, we've got to delay the inspector for half an hour. Why? I don't know, but we've got to do it. Something terrible is going to happen if we don't. Um, I know. you you. you you keep a bottle of sherry in the cupboard, don't you, for uh, special occasions? No, yes, is the uh, head of the department. Get the sherry bottle out and we'll offer Oddling Smee a glass of sherry. Tell him it's your birthday. It's your birthday. I know it's in the morning, but, um, you know, this is special departmental tradition. On the head of the department's birthday, every visitor gets a glass of sherry. Oh, right. OK. So Oddling Smee arrives and is surprised to be offered a glass of sherry and told this um, completely spurious tale of why and eventually the half hour passes and, and Oddling Smee keeps saying you know I really ought to inspect the chickens oh no have another glass um, and eventually uh, I must inspect the okay come and inspect the chickens so the three of them go in none of them knowing what's going to happen and the two lab assistants are there and all is very calm and quiet and the monkey's sitting in its cage in one corner, but that's okay, that Jack can explain what that's doing there, and the inspector's not interested in monkeys. Okay, I want to inspect the chickens. Well, they look at where the chicken cages are, and there's a big sheet over the chicken cages, covering them completely. And the notice pinned to it, Dr. Cohen's light dark experiment. So Jack 
being fairly quick off the mark, figures something has happened to the chickens. <laughs> but they're behind, you can hear them going cluck, cluck, cluck. They all sound very happy. And um, the, 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 so Waddling Smith says, okay, can I, can I just peep behind this curtain and, and, um, and inspect the chickens? And the lab says, oh, you can't do that. That's three months work down the drain if you do that. The light dark experiment won't work if you let the light in when it's supposed to be dark. Oh, well, you can hear they're okay. Oh, yes, cluck, 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 very nice. Okay, well, okay. But next time I come, I want to see those chickens. Oh, yes, that's fine. No problem. We'll do that because the experiment will be over then. So Oddling Smee goes off and Jack turns to his assistant. What the hell is going on? <laughs> they pull off the sheet. The monkey has plucked all of the chickens. The room was knee deep in feathers. <laughs> <laughs> all true <laughs> not even terry could make that one not up. even terry could make that up but uh jack was like that this is entirely believable yeah <laughs> so i have another question um obviously professor of mathematics and you were at warwick university for quite a long time and you've obviously read about the unseen university of ankh-morpork i mean obviously there's no similarity whatsoever <laughs> between the two establishments is there um well uh the on the surface i mean the obvious thing about Ang unseen university in ankh-morpork is it it's it's modeled on a uh what the Cambridge and Oxford colleges definitely used to be like, and to some extent still are like. I mean, I, I did my degree in Cambridge. It was at Churchill College, which was a new college, but there were a lot of the old traditions. There was high table, there was um, sherry with the master, there were, uh, you know, and the fellows would go to the fellows room afterwards and so forth. Um, now, Warwick being a completely new university, I, it was, um, it was four years old when I arrived, 1967, as a PhD student. I was actually there for 42 years before I retired, um, with a few visits to America and Germany and New Zealand for three and a half years in the middle. Um, so yeah, so I grew up in the place. Now, um, on the surface, it, it wasn't like a Cambridge college very much at all. Um, we might all go out for a beer together, but we wouldn't go into the common room for sherry. Um, but the kind of academic politics and other things which Terry um, pokes fun at quite <laughs> reasonably enough, uh, that happens in all universities. It happens in all subject areas. It's a little bit different from one area to another. Mathematicians on the whole are more cooperative um, it, it, mathematicians quite often will go somewhere and give a lecture to the other mathematicians somewhere else at some other university you know a seminar this is what I'm working on at the moment this is where I got stuck does anybody have any ideas can you help a physicist or a biologist would hardly ever do that they would only give a talk after the work's been published in case somebody else got the same idea and stole it Mathematicians don't worry about people stealing their ideas. Um, I think because we tend to carve the subject up into little specialities and we all work in our own little piece. So no one's going to steal the ideas because nobody else understands that area anyway. Or if they do, they're all friends. Um, whereas in physics, if it's the latest thing, it's um, the Higgs boson or graphene or whatever, they all pile in. You know, uh, and then, then they worry someone else will beat them to it. Uh, but nonetheless, in mathematics, you do get uh, a certain amount of ideological disputes of there, there are people who are um, always make a nuisance of themselves in departmental meetings. You know who they are. You know what they're going to say. Nobody can stop them. They're going to say it anyway. So um, there are certainly quite a few aspects of academic life, even in a modern new university, which are uncomfortably close to unseen <laughs> university. <laughs> They have a more I, interesting librarian. <laughs> I, I think it's the fourth 
Science of Discworld book that starts with Ponder Stibbons explaining that every university needs a big thing. Yes. <laughs> a big project. That's right. Yes, you, 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 this, this is how you get your brownie points, you know, if the, one of the problems at Warwick, particularly when we started as a new university, was we couldn't have a big thing. We were too small, we were too young, the, the big things had already been taken. We couldn't do radio astronomy and set up a, a massive radio dish. Um, uh, we, uh, for years, the government wouldn't let us start a medical school. Um, so. But we did have the math department have one fairly big thing, which was we ran international conferences. Every year we had a symposium, uh, which I believe is a Greek word for drinking together. Uh, <laughs> but the, so we would invite about 200 of the world's top mathematicians to come to Warwick and stay for anything from two days to a year on some. Um, specific chosen topic and we could run those things fairly cheaply we got grants from the government to do it um, but it was our big thing it put Warwick maths on the map from day one most of the world's top mathematicians knew had been to Warwick University many of them they knew about Oxford and Cambridge and maybe a few other universities but most places in England they had no knowledge of never been to we were up there partly because Oxford and Cambridge failed to understand that they ought to be running this kind of thing. <laughs> they caught up later. <laughs> so were you involved involved in setting this up? I was a fairly young new lecturer when I arrived. So uh, for the first few years, um, I just enjoyed the visits from lots and lots of mathematicians and going to talks by famous people and so forth. It was a great atmosphere and it was very small. When I arrived, there were 600 students. It's about 22,000 now. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it expanded quite fast. Um, but it, yeah, 600 students in all subjects, postgraduate and undergraduate. So there are about 25 math postgraduates, some doing MSc, some doing PhDs. Um, and then, I got appointed there and by then we'd grown to about a thousand students. So initially I wasn't involved, but by 1989, um, I and three other uh, lecturers there, um, actually two of them were postdocs at that point. Um, we were in line to run one of these uh, symposia. The, Basically, the, um, the idea was in the early days, it was the senior professors who applied for these things. Mm. But very early on, um, the, the, the department decided that what they needed to do was get some of their younger people to apply for these grants and run these things with some help. <laughs> the credibility mm. came from what the senior professors had done. Um, but so the four of us got together and we had a year symposium, 1989, lots and lots of visitors. Uh, there was a secretary who helped find them accommodation, handle all the admin side of things. Our job was to choose the people, organise the talks, um, and talk to them, work with them. That was great fun. Yes, I, I can see a, a sort of parallel with Unseen University again. <laughs> the old wizards get the young ones to do all the hard work. That's right. <laughs> and turn up for the drinks. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, and it works. You know, it's because the young people are energetic. I mean, the, the old ones are more energetic than you might expect, but um, they, they often have many other jobs to do as well. You get lumbered with admin, you get lumbered with all sorts of things. Um, the young people are energetic. They, they're, they're, um, they have original thoughts. They come up with things that you wouldn't expect them to do. Warwick was great for that because being in the very early days, um, if anyone came up with a good idea, the, the, the department would tend to say, OK, try it. Let's see. Let's have a go at that. Whereas it, it, I, 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 have, I know from friends who have worked in places like Cambridge, you know, which has hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition and so forth. If you come up with a really new idea. The first thing that happens is somebody says, well, I'll tell you why we can't do that. 
<laughs> it wasn't like that at Warwick. It was basically, okay. well, we haven't got any money, but go for it. <laughs> and they were obviously happy for you and Jack to go off writing these books with Terry. And yes, that was well, that. That was partly the head of department. Well, the, the founding professor, who probably by that time wasn't head of department, was Christopher Zeman. And Christopher was very unusual. He was a world class mathematician. And he spent a lot of time wandering around schools, giving public lectures, talking to non-mathematicians, and he valued that kind of thing. He, he went on the radio and talked about topology on the third programme on BBC Radio. So he approved of that kind of thing. So when I started doing it, I think Christopher saw me as a kind of fellow spirit. Now, the rule was you had to do everything else. You had to do your normal job completely <laughs> but if he wanted to go off and do things like science of this world that was okay and in fact by 1997 which was just before the first science of this world book the university I, I was doing so much of this kind of thing that the university decided to make it official and I was relieved of undergraduate teaching duties and exam setting and a lot of committee work and everything else in order to make time for all the public understanding of science work. This was about the time Richard Dawkins had a professorship at, at Oxford for precisely that purpose. And I think Warwick felt we need one of those, but we can't get an endowed professorship from outside. We'll have to do it ourselves. So we got this Stuart bloke, let's um, turn him loose. And, and that, so they encouraged it, uh, which was refreshing and initially unusual. Nowadays, every mm. university wants somebody like this. It's gone from why are you wasting your time talking to the public from why you're wasting time doing research when you ought to be talking to the public. <laughs> Indeed, but no other university can go, well, why are you wasting your time writing with this Terry Pratchett fellow? <laughs> no, and Warwick also has the distinction of giving Terry the first of his honorary degrees. It, and I, think he, Terry... I think he had 10 or has 10. Um, that was quite interesting, actually, because Jack, Jack and I actually were responsible for that. Um, what happened was we were talking about this in the common room and um, I said, you know, why, does, why don't we give Terry an honorary degree? And Jack said, I, I don't know, has he got one? So hauled out his phone, which was typical Jack, phoned up Terry, said, Terry, have you got an honorary degree? No. Would you like one? Yes. Right. We'll see what we can do. So we didn't really know how to go about this being slightly tricky. So we, we, we sidestepped the system because we didn't know what it was. And we wrote a letter to the vice chancellor because we both knew the vice chancellor anyway, fairly well. And said, Brian, um, we think Warwick ought to offer an honorary degree to someone called Terry Pratchett, multi-million pound best-selling author, millionaire. Um, very famous among people who read that kind of thing. So Brian Follett, the vice chancellor, got this letter. It happened to be the morning of the committee meeting to decide who got honorary degrees. And they had one spare one to offer. And he turned up and he said, I've had this weird letter from the maths department saying we ought to give a degree to someone called Terry Pratchett. And the head of English who was in the committee stood up and said, he's fantastic. My daughter loves his books. We should do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. <laughs> yeah. Again, so, one of one of those yeah. lucky coincidences. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, a narrative sometimes works and it worked on that occasion. Yeah, it does indeed. Um, well, look, thank you very much indeed for talking to us, Ian. Um, As I always, it's been one, a pleasure. And uh... I have one further thing to do, and I need a hat for this. And this is, <laughs> if I can do this, to, to wish you a very happy hogs watch. <laughs> right. <from there. laughs> and we trust that you have been nice rather than naughty. Otherwise, the hog father will not treat you kindly. Well, sometimes the two sort of merge together, don't they? Um, so uh, I, I'm reasonably confident that the hog father will look kindly upon me. 
I certainly hope he does. Well, look, <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Ian. And You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>